All right, Dr. Sharon Stills, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you. It is, it is an honor to be here. I am super excited. I'm excited. I, I was just sharing with you kind of the framework that we're going to discuss today. And I love your work. Uh, we've connected a little over a year ago, I believe. I was on your awesome podcast, The Science of Self-Healing Podcast. First of all, I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> so you interviewed me and then you also had a great summit that you interviewed interviewed me for. Now the tables have turned, Sharon, and now I'm interviewing you. <laughs> and I, I love your work. I really enjoyed preparing for this interview and, and getting all the things ready to have a great conversation. Uh, so let's get into your story first and foremost. You've been in the game of holistic health for 20 plus years. How did that even get started? What were some of the lessons you learned? And what are you, what is your main focus in this space? Oh my space? gosh, I could spend the whole podcast <laughs> telling my, my story. There's It's funny because there's so many different pieces to it as far as- I know as Suzanne Summers played a role in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many different pieces from my- I, you know, I'll just give you like the, the big bullet points. I mean, I spent my childhood very, very ill. I was, this is, I'm- this, I was growing up in the 70s, so this dates me back a while, but I spent my years in and out of the hospital under oxygen tents. And that's why I say this dates me because I don't even think that's really a treatment wow. anymore. But I had such severe asthma. I had such severe allergies. I was overweight. I was depressed. I was an addict. I had menstrual issues. I mean, you name it. I had it. I was chronically ill. I was always sick. And so, you know, my parents, rest of their souls, did the best they knew and took me to the pediatrician who did the best he knew, but that was giving me medications, giving me allergy shots, giving me, I mean, antibiotics weekly at points, just constantly, wow. constantly. And so by the time I was um, married early and pregnant by 20, and I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do about my baby? Like I was nervous. I didn't want them to be as sick as I was. And so I got introduced into alternative medicine and it just made so much sense to me. It was like, oh my God, you mean the McDonald's and the Carvel soft serve ice cream I was growing up on that, that played a major role in why I could never breathe and why I was overweight and depressed and so sick and all of these things. And so it was just like, wow, I just needed to hear it. And I was like, I was off and running. And so this is back in the early 90s. There's no internet. There's no podcast. There's there's a library and a health food store and digging through trying to figure things out. And so I ended up curing myself by... I've been gluten-free since the early 90s before. I don't even know if the word, the term gluten-free exists. No, it wasn't around back then. Yeah. You were, you were that term, but there was no such thing as gluten-free. Now it's all over the place. And I remember going to a restaurant back then and saying, I'd like to have a burger, but I don't want the bun. And it was like, what the waiter had to go get the chef who had to get the manager. It was like, I, they didn't understand. And I just said, I just want the burger. Just put it on a plate and give me a fork. And it was so far beyond their thinking. They were so confused. It like short circuited their brain that they couldn't understand <laughs> Put a burger on a plate instead of on a bun. And so I have been at this a long time. And so when it comes to hormones, I, I had cured myself with the gluten, all that, but it hadn't taken care of my hormones. And I was someone we were talking before and you were saying, you know, we want to talk about women who suffer when five days out of the month they're before their periods, they're just miserable. I was the person who suffered three weeks out of the month. It was like, I went from PMS, 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 got my period, felt good for about two or three days. And then the PMS just started all over again. And if you go to my website, I tell my story, but people used to ask me when my baby was due because I was so bloated because my hormones were so messed up. And that just ended up being a mortifying, and this didn't just happen once, this happened a lot. And it was mortifying for me. And if the person who asked had any sense of compassion, it ended up being mortifying for them as well. And so I struggled and I struggled. And part of that struggle with hormones was a journey through being a vegan 
part of that struggle with hormones was not understanding that my liver played a role, that my lymphatic system played a role, that my lifestyle played a role, that stress played a role. And so fast forward, I'm now a naturopathic physician. I went through naturopathic medical school, graduated in 2001. I go back to the East Coast. I open up my clinic. And in so I opened my clinic in 2002. And one of a very early on patient. And so I had gone to school to be a naturopathic pediatrician because I had spent, I didn't really tell this part, but I'd spent so much time figuring out how to help my son not be sick like I was when he was a baby. And because there was no podcast, there were no podcasts and there were no Googling internet, asking questions, I thought, wow, I want to help other parents because I've done a lot of the footwork. It was not easy to do this footwork. There was like this one book, Dr. Mendelssohn, about how you should raise your children naturally. And so I did all my clinical training in pediatrics. And I also had like a, a side interest in psychiatrics. I had a brother who had committed suicide. And so that was a subject near and dear to me that I, if I could help prevent other people. And then I open up my clinic and the seventh patient in the door is a stage four pancreatic um, patient dealing with stage four pancreatic cancer. Then wow. after that, there's a woman saying with Suzanne Summers' book saying like, I want what she's having. I want these hormones. And I thought, okay, the universe sends you like what you're supposed to be <laughs> doing. I'm going to have trust in that and faith in that. And so I read Suzanne Summers' book and I thought, wow, Chrissy from Three's Company has got a lot of medical knowledge, surprisingly. And I thought with my studying as a physician and all the work I have studied over in Europe and Switzerland and Germany and learning their natural therapeutics, I thought I can do this and I can like make it even better. And so I started to treat her changed her life. She told two friends, they told two friends, they told two friends, like the shampoo commercial, I always say. And the next thing I knew, I had this big practice focusing on oncology, which we're not really talking about today, but on bioidentical hormones and menopause. And so here I am, one of my, I'm looking at my physician oath hanging on my wall over there. And one of the one of the parts of the oath I take is physician heal thyself or docere, doctor as teacher even equal guide, not standing on a pedestal like we have thought about doctors in the past or how we've been trained to think about doctors. And so I thought, wow, I'm helping all these women. I'm like watching these women. They're they're aging backwards in front of me. They're getting sexier. They're getting clearer. They're getting more passionate. And I'm in my early 30s at the time. This is 2002. And I'm like, wearing something big because I look so bloated because my hormones are a mess and dealing with PMS. And I thought, I've got to practice what I preach. And so I started to apply those philosophies and those principles to me as a cycling woman, not as someone who had stopped getting her cycle. And kabam, my hormones balance, no more of this miserable three weeks out of every month. I mean, that's a horrible way to live. And so that's how I really got started in, in hormones and all that. And then I went through my own menopausal journey. Uh, it's been six years now and I'm 54 now. So I went through on a little bit of the earliest side, 48, but still totally normal because 50, 51 is the average. So if that's the average, some are going to go through in their 40s and that's normal. We tend to think menopause is going to be in our 50s or late 50s, but that's not necessarily the case. And I actually, because I was so blessed to be in this field and to be helping all these women, and because I pre-gamed and balanced my hormones when I was in my early 30s, when I went through my own menopause transition, I never even had a hot flash. And there's not a lot of women who can say that, but it really taught me as a physician this huge lesson again, because prevention is so important and that menopause or perimenopause, or having our cycles. These are not medical diagnoses. These are not diseases that we need to treat. These are natural transitions. And the only time we have symptoms and trouble with them is when our body is out of balance and our body is giving us the message, the sacred message of symptoms to get our attention. I love that. I love I love what you just ended with there. The symptoms to get our attention. I'm a big believer that 
symptoms are a beautiful blessing from the innate intelligence to teach you something, to show you the body's out of homeostasis. Your hormones are out of uh, balance. Your inflammation is too high. There's interference. So what a blessing to have that check engine light, right? And your story is awesome and, and super relatable. And I love how, Sharon, you were not only teaching it, but you saw that you needed to apply it on yourself and then live it to lead it, right? And you would change your hormones. So the conversation that I'd like to have with you here is about hormones. We know that hormones are these chemical messengers, and I want you to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that, but they're attaching to receptor sites and uh, how sensitive is that receptor site? Is it picking up the message? So speak on hormones, some of your favorite hormones to pay attention to and how they actually function in the body and why balancing your hormones is part of the key to living a long, healthy life. Hmm. I, I, have, I have a saying where I say balanced hormones equals sanity. So if you, <laughs> if you are not feeling in sane in any sense of the word, then there's probably a hormone involved. And our hormones, I think of them as, a, and a lot of people will say this, like a symphony because they all play together. You can't really, it's funny. I had a patient yesterday who was like, I want you to prescribe thyroid hormone for me because I mentioned to her that I thought her thyroid probably needed some TLC. But I was like, well, I can't just do that. We have to check your adrenals first because we don't want to rev your thyroid if your adrenals are like, help me, help me, I'm sinking. And so I had to explain, like, we, they all work together. And to do this in an appropriate and proper way, we have to pay attention to all the hormones. We can't just piecemeal it. Oh, you're going to get some estrogen or, oh, you need some cortisol or, right. oh, we if need only your Only it was that simple, right? Yeah, that would be very nice. And so <laughs> they, they really work all together. And favorite hormone, gosh, there's so, there's so many to choose from. I mean, for women, I think progesterone mm. can be like a knock it out of the park game changer. Progesterone is a is an i call it like a natural xanax or a natural valium and so it can really for a lot of women who are low in progesterone due to excess estrogen toxic estrogens from the environment low thyroid function stress overworking your adrenal i mean the list goes on and on but for women who are low in progesterone you can be very anxious. You can be not sleeping. You're carrying around water weight and you're just like a barrel of nerves. And when your body gets some progesterone, it really is like a giant exhale. So I, I love progesterone. I've been given flowers by patients' husbands after giving patients and balancing their hormones and their progesterone because they're like, oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have given me my wife back. Like I did not know who I was living with. <laughs> and do you use or, um, progesterone orally or do you use the cream? What do you, or do you do both? So I, I actually do both because yes. they have different mechanisms of action. And so the oral, the sustained release, and I just want to make sure everyone knows when we're talking about hormones, I am always, always, always talking about bioidentical hormones unless I'm yes. talking about the detrimental effects of synthetic hormones, of which there are many. But so good, we're talking about start, progesterone, yeah. bioidentical progesterone, even though we're talking fast, so we don't always say bioidentical. But with progesterone, the oral uh, will cross the blood-brain barrier. It'll have a nice GABA-like effect, which is our one of our major neurotransmitter, inhibitory neurotransmitters. And so I like to give some oral. It's great for helping to sleep and relax and all of these wonderful things. But the cream, the way I apply it, um, actually goes much more systemic. And so you get a lot more effect for the body, for the uterus, for the bones, for the gut, for where everywhere there's progesterone receptors, which is throughout the whole body, not just on your uterus. So don't let anyone ever tell you, oh, you had a hysterectomy, you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone. That is like archaic medical thinking. Yeah, and so totally. I use both. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, yin hormone. So we have like yin and yang in uh, Chinese medicine. So yin meaning like inward quiet. So I use progesterone in the evening because that's when you are going inward, you're going to be going to sleep. But I do use both. That's great. Yeah. And for progesterone, it's, it's that feel good, everything's okay <laughs> type of hormone. And most people are depleted, even men, by the way. I mean, there's a, 
I, I've I've experimented with the cream cyclically just to see you know what it does for me. So I've like did like 14 days, 21 days straight. I didn't really notice anything personally, but I do so many things that it's hard for me to pinpoint. That's the reason why my HRV increased or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. I do see the value in it, especially for women, especially for women right before their period when they really need to build progesterone, right? And then you'll talk about the postmenopausal women shortly. So let's stay on the the menstruating women here. Yes. You mentioned and I just you, want to say for yeah. men, because I'm glad you brought that up. I do use a lot of times I'll use sublingual drops for men. I see that. I haven't works. tried that yet. Yeah. Yeah. I see that works really well for them. It's not something I do for women, but it's something I do for men. But for menstruating women, that is so. And we're going to talk about non menstruating and we're going to sing our praises to estrogen because she is glorious. But when you <laughs> when you are younger and you are still cycling, very, very often the majority, and it's not to say for everyone, but the majority of the issues then will be that there's an estrogen dominance, that you're not producing enough progesterone. And that's why we'll see all these horrible premenstrual issues because there's estrogen, but there's no progesterone to oppose it. And so for these women who are cycling, we have to look at a lot of things. We have to make sure the liver is clearing. So I love, I mean, I, you know, when I work with patients, I do specific liver support depending upon what part of their liver is not functioning or where they're, you know, they don't have cofactors. We're moving the bile because a lot of times we think about the liver, but we forget we got to get the bile moving. That's, that's equally, if not more important. And so I love castor oil packs. Oh, me too. Every night I wear it. <laughs> <laughs> so they're a fantastic thing if you're a cycling woman to do in the latter part of your cycle, which typically we say a cycle is 28 days. There's a little bit of, um, you know, some women are a little shorter, some a little longer, and that could be normal for you. But so typically, like if you do have a 28 day cycle, then day 14 is when you're going to start the luteal phase, the second part of your cycle. And doing castor oil packs there can be very nourishing. It makes you lie down and be with a pack for 40 minutes. Uh, it's a great time to meditate or pray or listen to solfeggio frequencies or whatever it is you want to do to nurture yourself. But we tend, I find that a lot of times you know, we're out of sync with our cycles and having premenstrual issues because we're out of sync with life. We're out of sync with the sun rising and the sun setting, and we're in these artificial environments and we're not getting into nature and we're not resting. When back in the, the ancestral days, they had the red tent and the women would go to the tent when they were bleeding and they would nourish each other. They would be in community with their sisters. They wouldn't be responsible. They would be fed. So they wouldn't be responsible. And it was like, they got to just be on their moon and bleed and reconnect and regroup. And we don't, you, you can't call in sick to your boss and be like, oh, I'm on my moon. I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> that won't work. Yeah, that won't work. I mean, I wish, I wish it would. But we, we don't have society set up like that. So we really need to to take the time ourselves. Yeah. And if we are still working, can we can we cut out some of the extracurricular activities? Can we be nour more nourishing? Can we can we get more sleep? Can we take a bath or whatever it is? And and can we make a priority to be connected to the moon, to the sun? to the seasons, to the ground beneath us. These things are really very important for having a healthy menstrual cycle. Ah, oh, so good. I, I didn't know that about the red red tent. That is um, interesting. And you're right, we're very disconnected from the way that things used to be for many, many, many years. And now we are going through the artificial junk light and we've got stress from watching the news and traffic and all these different stressors very different now than it was back in the day. So you gave a great tip. I, I hope the audience got that. The keto campers listening and watching castor oil pack day 14 or so. I, I wear it to bed, right? And I wear it all night. It stains my bed sometimes, which is the problem. <laughs> and my fiance gets mad sometimes, but I wear it every night. I love the castor oil, but loving your liver is important, especially if you're estrogen dominant, especially if you have heavy periods, love your liver, take some liver support. You mentioned the bile part. If you're doing keto, Bile is very important. I call it the liquid gold on keto. You got to break down the fat 
So love your liver, take some liver support, castor oil pack, any other things that you do for the liver? Have you done uh, experimenting like uh, a PC push or coffee enemas? Or things oh, like that? yeah, I tend to. So when I'm working with patients who are dealing with cancer, I definitely have them doing coffee enemas. Um, I do a lot of PC pushes, uh, but more so with like neurodegenerative disorders, Got it. PLS, Parkinson's, MS. I find for, I mean, you can do those things, but I find I don't have to escalate to such strong treatments with this. If you're doing castor oil, if you're staying hydrated, if you are moving your lymphatic system. So I'm like, love your lymph, your liver, and your life. And you're kind of, that's like the, the three L's right the there. I love it. Yeah. I'm like, I got to write a book called that <laughs> with that as a title, but you know, making sure you're sweating, making sure your lymph is moving, making sure you are moving. And so, and then for the liver, I like to use different supplements. You know, you could take phosphatidylcholine orally, um, taking, you know, dandelion or silymarin or different um, amino acids, depending upon what pathway you're trying to run in your phase two detoxification. Um, so, you know, for that kind of stuff, I like to say, like, work with someone so they can figure out because, you know, is your phase one slow or is your phase two slow? Sometimes you need extra antioxidants to make sure in there. So that needs to be looked at a little specifically, but generally thinking, I mean, you can start your morning with some warm lemon water. Uh, I usually tell patients to use like a stainless steel or a bamboo um, straw because you don't want the lemon water getting on your teeth and rotting the animal. But starting your day that way, I like to eat according to um, like an Ayurvedic perspective of eating your biggest meal in the middle of the day when your digestive fire is strongest. Um, definitely, you know, the fasting and the intermittent fasting and the timed eating, um, which I'm sure most of the people listening, this is your peeps, they're doing that. You know, big thing for me also is no food like three hours before you go to bed. You got to let your nervous system relax. Of course, stress and being in a parasympathetic state, that kind of to me goes without saying, but I'm going to say it because we can't heal if we're stressed out. So we have to do these things to bring our nervous system to a peaceful place. And that could be cold plunging, meditation, floating in a deprivation tank, earthing every morning, dancing. There's lots of different ways to kind of settle our system down. I'm a huge, huge proponent of mindfulness and breathing um, as a foundation of everything we do, because if we are if we are in tune and have a relationship with our breath and we are mindful of our surroundings, then we can take that that baseline to whatever else it is we're doing, to hugging a tree, to sitting in the cold, to going in a sauna, to hiking in the woods, whatever it be. But we, we need to learn to breathe and we need to learn to be present. And easy to say, can be a lifetime of learning. And so that is something that we just have to constantly, just like when you learn to meditate and we say, count your breath, a good place to start is count your breaths, get to 10. And you are you don't even sometimes make it to one and you're already thinking about, oh, did I forget to bring that in from the car? Is the food still in the car? Is it going bad? Or And so that that's just the human condition. And so it's this act of kindly and gently bringing your mind from over here back to your breath. And you may just go from one to one to one to one to one for a while till you can count a little higher. And that's okay. It is a practice just like building a muscle in the gym is. It's the practice of building your, your mindfulness muscle. That's it. And it's so important these days. So many people are sympathetic dominant, myself included, especially a few years ago. But I've gotten better, much, much better with doing a lot of the things you mentioned. And a good gauge for that is your heart rate variability. I see you have the aura ring on just like I do. We have the same color too, uh, <laughs> the gold. Um, that's a good gauge. You know, if you're tracking your HRV or heart rate variability um, and you see that steadily increasing, that means you're, you're doing a better job at balancing out the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Do you use that for your patients at all? Or what, what are your thoughts on the HRV as a gauge for that? Yeah, I have a lot of patients who will wear the aura ring, and I think it's a great gauge for the HRV. Also, 
I have like three different HRV machines that I use with patients. And so I use the nerve, um, nerve express, I use the heart quest. There's another one I'm getting the sound of soul that gives you your heart song. Yeah. Kelly Kennedy. Yes, I yeah. love Kelly Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. So Kelly and I were in Germany together when we found that machine. And so, oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but nerve express is a great one. That's Alexander Riftine. Um, so that's one of my favorite, just for like baseline, where are you at in your sympathetic, parasympathetic? And I can tell you all my chronically ill patients, always, it's always sympathetic dominance. It's very yeah. rare Same. to see a power, like I'm parasympathetic. I have like, I've been at this a long time. So I have a very balanced nervous system, but it's always like, oh my God, like if we're at a conference and they do me, it's like, oh my God, look at her. It's like, you know, some strange <laughs> rare breed, like, look at that. Oh my God. But um, it's really important. It's how it's such a driving factor of disease and stress comes in so many shapes, sizes, and flavor, whether it be emotional stress or mental stress or transgenerational stress or chemical yeah. stress or EMF stress or physical stress, the subluxation in your, in your spine. So there's so there's the stresses, just even biochemical stresses in our body, if we're not detoxing properly, if we're overloaded, if we're leaning towards being too acidic where we should be alkaline or too alkaline where we should be acidic. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many different avenues that our body can get stressed. And so we really need to empower ourselves selves and take responsibility and really be evaluating our lives and seeing some of the stresses. Like I had a patient the other day, he lives on a lake. He had high levels of organophosphates when I checked his testing and they're spraying the lake and he doesn't have a lot of control over that. He's tried speaking to the homeowners association. He hasn't gotten very far. You know, could he move? Yeah. But is that realistic? Maybe not. And so some of these stress, what they're spraying above the chemtrail, like some of this we can't control, but we can control the food we're putting in our mouth. We can control what time we choose to go to bed. We can control how we're spending our time, how we're moving our body. Ultimately, we can control the thoughts we're thinking. That's and right. and I know I know you and I connect on like really everything <laughs> and our thoughts creating our reality. And sometimes though that takes a lot of work because we have trauma and we we've been taught from a young age to see the world a certain way. And so we have to unwind that it's it's a con there's it's a constant commitment to healing yourself and so i've been doing this god i've been on a healing journey since my early 20s so a, a good 30 years mm -hmm. and i i still like i look at my calendar and i'm like i have a i have a session with a healing coach tomorrow i have a session with a medical intuitive like i'm still constantly doing these things and i'm at a really good place in my life but there's, it's an onion. We are this human spiritual being having this human experience. And there's always an onion layer to peel off and learn more about ourselves and actualize our experience. Beautiful. You're a lifelong learner. I love that. I, I could totally relate to that. And it is like an onion. You're just peeling back and peeling back and the universe, nothing in the world, nothing in the universe stays the same, meaning either you're going forward or you're going backwards nothing stays the same. I mean, a glass of water is moving. <laughs> you just can't see it. Everything is moving. So I love that you're constantly aware of uh, the things that you're doing in your growth. And that's an interesting product, the Nerve Express uh, HRV. I'm going to check that out. And um, yeah, Aura Ring has been great for me. Uh, I, I love that it's giving you different metrics as well. Mm. But I'm going to check out this Nerve Express one. So yeah, it's a great one. Like if you're to have in the office with patients that you can... Yeah hook them up. It takes like eight minutes. It's non-invasive. And yeah, I think the aura ring is a, I, you know, I, I like, I wake up in the morning and I check my aura yeah. ring and I see my crowns and I'm like, it's reminding me that I'm a queen. Thank you very much. Aura. <laughs> Thank you, Aura. <laughs> and I go on about my day. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> All right. So we've spoken about the woman who have a menstrual cycle. You gave some really great tips on that. Now, Let's talk about perimenopause and then the postmenopausal women. Um, there is a misconception that I know you're doing a good job at breaking this myth where a lot of conventional doctors are doing some harm here, 
where all of these symptoms, hot flashes, hormonal issues, feeling awful during this transition, it's just part of it. You just got to deal with the suffering. Is that true? No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them, Sharon. <laughs> that is not true. So that is, again, like we were saying before, that's the sacred symptoms. That's the sacred messenger saying, hey, something's out of balance here. And it could be a contributing factors of you're not eating right, you're not sleeping right, you're not loving yourself right. But it also can simply be, hey, you're going through menopause and your hormones are dropping because that's what happens when we go through menopause. And it's time to get with someone and get them rebalanced so that you can journey on the many, many years. It's not like when we were ages and ages ago when women's job was to reproduce and then they weren't really necessary anymore. So they were dying in their 40s. Now we live at least half, if not two thirds of our life, if we if we really extend to our biological capacity of how, how old we can age to, then we're living a long time postmenopausally and we're doing ourselves a very big disservice if we're not replacing that hormone. So as I said in the beginning, menopause is not a disease. It annoys me that there's like ICD-10 ICD codes that I have to, you know, can put for patients for it being a disease because it's not. It is a natural transition that everyone who is born a woman is going to go through. It, it's like death and taxes. You can put menopause in there. This, this, is, <laughs> this is happening. And how our mindset is, is going to be how we see this process. Are we going to be afraid of it? Are we going to dread it? Are we going to be depressed or are we going to be celebrating that we are entering this new wise stage in our lives as women and that we have so much to share? We may not be able to physically birth a human child, but we can physically birth so many beautiful, creative ideas. We can birth new aspects of ourselves. We can birth new relationships, new creations, new adventures, new journeys, new understandings. There, there's, it's just like this wide open mural that we can take the paintbrush and paint however we like. And you know what? If you start painting and you don't like your painting, you can start again. <laughs> so, so no, it shouldn't be painful that that to think that is doing you a misservice. And I definitely want to speak to perimenopause. This is this very misunderstood time because we think menopause is in our 50s. So when we're having issues in our 40s, many times a physician will say, that's not your hormones. That, that has nothing to do with menopause. You're 41. You're not going to go through menopause for 10 years. Here, take an antidepressant or here, live with it, or here, you know, suck it up, buttercup. And the truth is perimenopause, and especially with the toxic environment that we are living in that, mm. you know, just getting more toxic. I mean, I don't have any fantastic news around that. I mean, the earth is, <laughs> the earth is not cooperating with our <laughs> desire to detox right now and with everyone upon it and all the chemicals and all the companies and greed overtaking health. And so we can be, we can have perimenopausal symptoms even in our thirties. And so you, you know, I'm saying this, I mean, this is for the men too, but definitely for the women, like trust yourself, trust your intuition. No one, not like, I don't claim to know more about my patients' bodies than they do. Like you live in your body 24 seven. If you tell me as your physician that you have this feeling or this intuition that something off there's something off with your hormones i take it seriously and i investigate so don't let any doctor tell you that has nothing to do with it you're crazy and shut you down like trust in your intuition we are we are gifted with this beauty especially as females of intuition and knowledge and knowing our bodies you know better than anyone when something is off so perimenopause can be happening in your 30s, certainly in your 40s. And so it it is a time where your hormones, I call it like, you know, it's a roller coaster. And so I had a patient the other day who wanted to do hormone testing and she's very perimenopause. Her periods aren't coming regularly. And I said, you we could do some, but how do we know if we're catching you at the top of the roller coaster? Mm. 
or did we get you after you've already ah went down the roller coaster and now you're down at the bottom? So a lot of times with perimenopause, I just can help a woman listening to her symptoms. We can do some testing, but testing has its limitations. Whereas once you've gone through menopause, then testing is really important because we have to see what we're replacing and how you're metabolizing it and what you're doing with it. So I'm not saying I never test in perimenopause, yeah. but if you are getting tested, I think what I want the take home message to be is if you are getting tested, understand that if your test results don't make sense, it's a roller coaster and maybe your test was taken at the wrong part of the roller coaster. That's a good, that's a good point right there. And I, I love how you give women hope, you know, it's such you, the way you look at this transition from perimenopause to menopause is a beautiful paintbrush and you could create whatever you want. And you're still right because most women are, who live a long, healthy life, they're going to live most of their years in the postmenopausal era versus the, you know, the cycling era. So you might as well make it the best time of your life and you can. And I love how you give them hope. Uh, let's stay on the topic here of testing hormones. What are you, I know there's three different ways to test hormones, right? There's blood, there's urine, there's saliva. Maybe if you could share the pros and cons of all three and then um, your favorite way of testing for <laughs> menopausal versus the perimenopause. Can I just talk about my favorite? Because <laughs> I've, I've been, you know, I've been at this 20 plus years. So I've been through all the testing and I've just really come to like, this is what works. And don't waste time doing the other things. So but it's important for you to share that so they know not to waste their time with it because their doctor so, might be doing the tests that are not that good, right? So let's talk about blood work because okay. blood work is the way that most women have their hormones tested. Yep. And that's really sad because that is very misleading. So there are some, I mean, don't get me wrong. I run about 30 tubes on every new patient. I love blood work. Blood work tells me a lot because I look at it from a very functional perspective. Yeah. So you can definitely look at your thyroid hormones in your blood work. Um, and that would be your free T3, your free T4, your TSH, your reverse T3. That's one that's skipped a lot and that's really important. It can be the the crossroad between does someone need T4 or is that gonna actually make them make more reverse T3 and do they mm -hmm. only need reverse, and do they only need T3? Um, and you need to look at your antibodies, your anti-TPO and your thyroglobulin antibodies to make sure you do or don't have Hashimoto's because Hashimoto's, and we could do a whole talk on this, but that's an autoimmune mediated thyroid issue. So the treatment needs to be very different, figuring out why your immune system is attacking your thyroid. And often that can be from eating gluten or foods that mole molecularly mimic Gluten could be from low glutathione, low vitamin D, mercury in your mouth is a big one. That's a big that one for drives sure. It. Yeah. Just a few side notes there. So I like thyroid in the blood. Uh, testosterone and free testosterone, I, I have I trust pretty well in the blood, especially for men. Um, DHT in the blood is good to run. That's dihydrotestosterone to see how you're metabolizing. For men, estradiol in the blood. For women, it's a little more complicated because we're looking at estriol and estrone and different things. But for men, that's pretty accurate. Um, I like SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin in the blood. I like vitamin D, which we always forget is a hormone. So you got to check that in the blood. Uh, you could do parathyroid hormone in the blood. That's accurate. So there are definitely some things, but when we're talking about the big sex hormones like progesterone or estrogen, I don't really rely on blood. Maybe in a menstruating woman, I might do like a day 19 to day 21 draw and see what's her estradiol compared to her progesterone. But when we're talking about someone who's postmenopausal, we really want to see the breakdown of estrone and estradiol and estriol. We want to see the metabolites. We want to see, are we metabolizing towards breakdown products that drive DNA damage or bone breakdown, or are we metabolizing to something like 2-methoxyestradiol, which is actually breast cancer preventative or treatment. Yep. So I'm a really huge fan of 24-hour urine and real urine. I don't use the dried urine. I don't think it's as accurate. So, so you, don't like, you don't like Dutch that much? 
Oh. You prefer not to use Dutch, is what you're saying? I, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> Dutch was like, you know, Dutch wasn't even a sparkle in their father's eye when, when I started doing this. So I use um, Jonathan Wright's lab, Meridian Valley, and I do 24-hour urine testing. So you're, carrying, you're carrying a jug, 24-hour, peeing in that jug yes. for 24 hours. And there's no, yeah. very transparent. Everything goes in there. Yeah, and I've talked to some of the labs, and they – They've even said, like, you know, we'll offer dry because we have to, but the most accurate is 24-hour urine. And so we we need to, like, again, we need to be willing to pee for 24 hours and not take the easy way out to get the real accurate levels. Totally. So that is what I'm using um, for saliva. I don't really do, if, if you're a menstruating woman, you can do saliva samples throughout the cycle. And if you're not on any hormones, that can be a good baseline. I used to do those a lot. And then I just kept seeing the same thing. Women have no progesterone. They're estrogen dominant in the second part of their cycle. And so I kind of stopped doing them so often unless someone really needs to see the data. Um, but using, so using, so I don't really rely on saliva. I lost my train of thought there for a second, but I don't really rely on saliva for much, except for I like it for cortisol levels. It's where cortisol is free, bioactive, available in the saliva, and you can do the four samples. And again, every test has its limitations and its great points. So you're getting a snapshot and in, shot into someone's day. And I usually, it's like where I can play psychic doctor. I'm like, okay, let me look at your, your saliva results and your cortisol. And I'm like, okay, you wake up fine. You're on the couch by two. You're, you're, you know, instead of going to sleep at 10, you're mopping the floor. Like I usually can plot out and they're like, oh my God, that's exactly me. And that's not every time, but a lot of the time. And it also gives you your DHEA. So it gives you your cortisol DHEA ratio. It tells you how far down the adrenal rabbit hole you have gone. And so I really like that for cortisol levels. I don't really like um, like the morning cortisol in the blood work. I don't think that's that accurate. So that's kind of just my, I think, did I cover them all? You did. Um, I, I the point of that, what you just shared is that it's not as easy as just getting some blood work done and saying your hormones are off. There's so many different moving parts. So you have to work with somebody like Sharon who understands this um, because to your point, it's just not as easy as just getting some blood work done and saying, this is your problem. You got to look at it from a full lens. Go ahead. Yeah. I just, to add to that, cause that's such a good point. And I see this a lot with thyroid and I just yeah. finished telling you that I love the thyroid, you know, I love blood for thyroid. That being said, I can't tell you how many patients a week this happens where their thyroid levels actually look okay, but they're still the poster child for a low thyroid. Their hair is falling out, yeah. constipated, they can't lose weight, their brain fog, their muscles hurt, et cetera, et cetera. And so even within that being said, you know, then I have to be like, okay, well, Let's do a pre and post iodine test. Let's see what your iodine levels look like. Let's check your temperatures. Let's see if your temp temperature's low. And even if that all checks out and their blood looks okay, but they're still like screaming hypothyroid, I'm like, let's do a trial run of some bioidentical thyroid hormone and see how you feel. And then more often than not, they're like, oh my God, everything feels better. And so the lesson there is just because the blood work looked okay, like that's just an average, like you are all individuals. And so we, I don't treat lab results. Right. I work yeah. with patients and it's a good day in the clinic when, oh my God, the lab results match the patient. Like, oh, that's easy. Okay. But you know, life doesn't work like that. And we certainly don't work like that as human beings seeking balance. And so you really need to find someone who has an open mind and isn't limited by a lab range. Mm, so good. So good. Last thing I want to ask you, Sharon, is the importance for the postmenopausal women out there the importance for them to really focus on that parasympathetic um, and adrenal support and the role of what the adrenals do to kind of pick up the slack during that time and some of your favorite oxytocin activities for the adrenals. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that is such a good point because theoretically, when you go through menopause, the adrenals should be picking up the slack. 
But the truth is we live in a very <laughs> adrenal havoc world and, you know, self-included, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> my adrenals were shot and I had to repair them. And it's something you pay attention to all the time or the adrenals will be very happy to let you know, Hey, I went down on you one, you know, I completely stopped working. I could do that again. That's not a problem. And so I love oxytocin. I actually, in my 24 hour urine testing, I measure oxytocin levels. Mm. And again, you know, there's never always, but more often than not, I see them very low. And so I use actually oxytocin compound and nasal spray that ah. you can use as a supplement, but oxytocin activities from orgasms by yourself with your loved one, um, hugging, massaging, dancing, bubble baths, acupuncture, tea ceremony, breathing, music, frequencies, lymphatic stimulation. I mean, they'll just, you know, what do you love to do and make sure you're doing it? Because often, especially as women, we put ourselves last. We pour and we water everyone else. And then by the time we're done watering everyone else, the can is empty. And we've been taught that it's selfish, selfish to put ourselves first. It's selfish to care about ourselves. And I'm like, self-care is anything but selfish. It is, it is necessity. We have to feed ourselves first. So then we have something to give to the other people in our life. It's okay to put yourself first. It's okay to nurture yourself. It's okay to love yourself. It's okay to care about yourself. Oh, amen to that. What a great way to cap this <laughs> off. Um, last question for you would, would be around the conversation of oxytocin. Uh, my favorite supplement, if you will, is a vitamin G, gratitude. <laughs> Big believer in what gratitude does for oxytocin production. So what are you grateful for today, Sharon? Oh my goodness. Every day I have so much to be grateful for. I, I start the day grateful that I've woken up and that I have another day to be on the earth and share my gifts and learn and grow and interact with people. I, I'm grateful for my health. I truly believe with you know our health is our wealth and it doesn't matter what else we have. If we don't feel good, we're not going to enjoy it. And so I'm sure. always grateful for my health. I'm grateful. You know, I have those two grandbabies <laughs> and every day I give gratitude that I get to be a part of their lives and help nurture these two little beings and watch them grow. I'm grateful for my children, my family. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for that. We get to share all this information and that we do have these avenues, these podcasts, these summits, these YouTube channels, these Instagrams that people get, it's so much easier to share this information and that we have a opportunity for so many people to hear and learn that they don't have to come work one-on-one, -on -one, that they can learn these things and it can make an impact in their health because it wasn't like that when I was sick or when my son was sick, it was a very yeah. different world. So I'm grateful for that as well. Beautiful. Those are a lot of beautiful things to be, to be grateful for. I love that, Sharon. Well, I'm grateful for you too and your brilliance and wisdom. Um, I love the approach that you take with your patients and just what you shared today. It's just giving a lot of people who probably have felt hopeless, helping them feel hopeful. And that's the goal, to inspire them to, to feel hopeful. So your website is drstills.com. Your podcast is the Science of Self-Healing Podcast. Anywhere else you want them to go check you out? I'm pretty much Dr. Sharon Stills. You know, if you put that in, you'll find me. And yeah, the science of self-healing is through um, Bioregulatory Medicine Institute. That's a nonprofit that I sit on the advisory board of. And so that's not really focused on hormones and menopause like we talked a lot about today. Um, that's really focused on bioregulatory medicine and how we heal and what bioregulatory medicine is as opposed to just doing functional medicine. And so if you are a lifelong learner and you're interested to know about other ways of healings and things that we have learned over in Europe, um, definitely check out the podcast, but um, don't go there expecting like you're going to hear about menopause. It's kind of my, it's kind of my other medical life. <laughs> totally, totally. Good, good clarification. We'll put that, we'll put a link for your website, your social media and the podcast below. 
And uh, we'll do a round two next year, Sharon. Thank you so much for the conversation. I've got a lot of vitamin G for you. And uh, (laughs) thank you for your brilliance. (laughs) Thank you.